As a fellow Republican, it makes me proud to see someone of your stature uh, heading up the party here in Arizona. And I am a partisan Republican. You know, I believe in my party and I believe in what it stands for, but I think, again, it's important to remember that this isn't a partisan issue, that there are people of goodwill on both sides of the aisle, and as Mayor Giuliani reminded me uh, when I sat back down, all of the Democrats who come to Paris and who are willing to stand with Madame Rajavi and with the Iranian resistance against the mullahs, two former chairmen of the Democratic Party, Ed Rendell, Governor Rendell from Pennsylvania, Howard Dean, who was already mentioned. We've got Patrick Kennedy. Is there a more famous Democratic name in America than Kennedy? Another person associated with the Clinton administration, only unfortunately she has not been able to persuade her former boss on this, is Patricia Solis Doyle. She headed up Hillary Clinton's uh, campaign for president last time around. Alan Dershowitz, there is no name more associated with liberalism in America than Alan Dershowitz. This is a cause that unites people who believe in human rights, who believe in freedom, who believe in self-determination, and who believe in national security. It unites all of us. The people in this room today, there are at least twice as many people here this year as there were last year. And I think last year I challenged you that when you went home, you had to talk to your neighbors and your friends. You had to talk about that issue. You had to do what the chairman just suggested. You have to educate people. And I'm going to challenge you to do that again. And it shouldn't be, you know, don't just talk to people who you think might agree with you. Talk to people and challenge people who may disagree with you. You know, as I say, this is not a partisan issue. It is not because Barack Obama, simply because he is a Democrat, that he's bad on this issue. The fact is, the President of the United States, when it comes to fighting terrorism, when it comes to understanding the threat against us, he's not a serious person. And if you want an example of that, you have to think back on only a few incidents. Mayor Giuliani talked about the vicious attack on his fellow soldiers uh, in the Fort Hood massacre. When the President of the United States came before the American people just literally hours after that Fort Hood massacre was taking place, did he, standing up before an audience and standing up before the Washington media, first and foremost talk about the terrible attack that had been taken place on one of our Army bases? No. He was there to promote political activity among uh, General Service Administration folks and to give shout-outs to people who were on his team. When James Foley was beheaded by ISIS and the President of the United States came and talked about that on national TV, what did he do when he left? Did he go back to the uh, National Security Council to go down into the secure room of the West Wing and gather together his military forces and his top advisors to say, what are we going to do about fighting this threat? No, he didn't do that. He headed to the golf course to play a few rounds. And what happened after he announced the death of Kayla Mueller? Again, did he sit down and say, okay, now we really do have to get serious? No. He cleared the room, and in the Oval Office, he got himself his little Apple iPhone or whatever phone he happens to use, and he took a selfie. And that selfie was hashtag YOLO, you only live once. Well, tell that to Kayla Mueller. She only lived once, and she gave her life because we have not been able to counter this threat that is a threat to all of us. This president has not been serious, and it is up to you to try to educate your fellow citizens, to demand of your media that they cover the resistance to the mullahs in Iran, because we don't get nearly enough attention. Sure, Fox News will occasionally pick up something, Madame Rajavi was on it, 
but do you see us as the lead item? You can have 100,000 people gathered in Paris, Iranian opposition movement gathered in Paris, and nobody's there to report it. So it's like a tree falling in the forest with no one there to tell the world what's happening. There is a moderate Islamic movement in the world, and it is headed up by a woman, Madam Mariam Rajavi, who is president-elect of the National Council of Resistance of Iran. And you've heard about her program today, and many of you know it firsthand because you were part of that movement. This is a movement that believes in all the things that we in America believe, that our founders believed in, freedom of press, freedom of the ballot box, freedom of religion, a separation between church and state so that you do not have the government telling you what to believe, how to believe, and how to practice your religion. Equality among all peoples, equality between men and women, equality between majorities and minorities. This is a movement that believes in the things that we in America believe. And it is a movement that deserves our support. And it is a movement that deserves more attention and that the American people should know about. Because as Mayor Giuliani suggested, there's always the question, whenever there is a beheading, whenever there is one of these horrific acts, there are some who will say, where are the moderate Muslims? Where are the Muslims who will stand up and say, we are opposed to terrorism, we are opposed to this barbarity, we are opposed to the kind of fundamentalist belief that are rooted in the ninth century and have no place in the 21st century? Well, they exist but not enough people know about them. So I charge you today, particularly those of you who are not of the Iranian American community, to go out and educate the people in your own communities about this resistance movement. And to the Iranian American community, I challenge you to have your voices heard. Anybody who's worked in politics as I have, when I worked for President Reagan, I was director of public liaison in the White House. And what did that office do? Well, we dealt with coalitions. We dealt with community groups. Mine was the office where if you had a group that wanted to hear someone from the administration speak on an issue, or if the president himself you wanted to invite to a meeting, you worked through my office to do that. Because we understood that it was community groups and often those community groups were ethnic-based or based on religion. We had the Sons of Italy, the Polish-American Congress. Uh, we had the American Jewish community and all of its various uh, organizations. Well, the Iranian-American community is one of the best educated, most successful communities in America. This is a community which has roots in the United States, many of you, even those who were not born in the United States have children who were born here, who were educated here. You need to become an active political voice. Your voices need to be heard in Washington. They need to be heard in the White House. They need to be heard in the halls of Congress. They need to be heard in your state houses. Only if you go out and make yourselves heard, if you become involved in elections, some of you may be Republican, some of you may be Democrat, some of you may have no particular party affiliation, but you've got to get involved. If you want to be heard, you've got to get involved. You also need to bring to task the media. When you see stories that either ignore what's going on or present a very slanted view of what's going on, you need to get out your pens or you need to get on your computer laptops and you need to send letters to the editor. You need to call the producers uh, of your local television stations. You need to get this message out because if you don't de do it, nobody will. Now, it is important that all of you speak with one voice and that we all speak with one voice. And there are a number of things that we must demand. First and foremost, as Americans, we have to protect our own national security. And protecting that national security means that we will not be safe here at home so long as we have a powerful, rich country run by fundamentalist, insane people, as the mayor suggested, 
who brutally oppress their own people, who have public hangings, who cut off arms, who stone women to death, who have vice police going out, and if you don't have your headscarf on exactly the right way and you're a woman, you may get beaten. And oh, by the way, these people who are out there to correct morality, they might rape you while they're also uh, at it to prove uh, how moral they are. This is what goes on in Iran, and we have to stand up to that regime, and we have to support those who are opposing it. But we also, as Americans, must make sure that our leaders do not sign agreements that allow that regime, which already has its oil wealth. I mean, this is a country that claims to be wanting to produce these nuclear reactors to produce more energy, when, as the mayor suggested, we've got hundreds, they've got hundreds of years supply of natural gas and oil at their disposal. This is not a country, you know, like France, which, requ which requires nuclear reactors uh, to produce electricity. This is a country that is an oil-rich country, and yet it is busy creating reactors, and it is very clear to anyone who studied the issue that they have no intention of stopping in their quest. They've been, their, their leaders have spoken out about it. Rouhani has spoken out about it. The, grand, uh, the Ayatollah has spoken out about it. You have over and over again the condition that Iran should be able to have its own nuclear weapons. Well, if Iran gets nuclear weapons, not only will it be able to fund the terrorists that blow up barracks of American soldiers um, in in Lebanon, not only will it be able to be funding attacks of Hezbollah and other uh, of its surrogates throughout the Middle East, but they're going to put those nuclear weapons into the hands of those who would do us harm. So it is in our interests. We must stand up. We must ensure that the United States does not become party to an agreement that will build a nuclear Iran. We must say no. And finally, and finally, we must not forget the 2,600 people who remain captive in Iraq. Iraq right now is an entirely unstable country. You've got uh, a, a government there that does not represent all the people in which there is sectarian violence that goes on, a country whose leaders are aligned with Iran, who have invited Iran in to have the Republican Guard, the Iranian Guard, there fighting uh, on the ground. We won't put troops on the ground to protect Iraq from ISIS, but we're perfectly happy to have Iran do so. And they are there fighting on the ground. And in the middle of that, I mean, just today we had an attack uh, on the, the base where our soldiers, our advisors, uh, were, uh, were staying. And in the middle of that horrendously dangerous situation, you have 2,600 people who are essentially behind barbed wire who cannot leave. They cannot even leave to go to the doctor. People who are suffering from heart disease, cancer, people who have life-threatening disease, who need dialysis. They can't even let these people out to go visit the doctor. They're kept there as if they are prisoners in a concentration camp. And people who in the past would have been able to defend themselves when we went into Iraq, uh, when these people were in greater numbers in Camp Ashraf, they were perfectly capable of defending themselves if they were attacked. They had weapons at their disposal. And what did they do when the United States invaded Iran? They voluntarily gave up every one of their weapons. They didn't keep so much as a single handgun to protect themselves. And as a result, what has happened is that you've had the uh, Maliki government go in, you've had the Iranians go in, and you've had people slaughtered, literally slaughtered. We've seen the pictures of these people who were shot in the head, shot in the face, their, their arms uh, tied in plastic handcuffs. They need to be able to protect themselves. 
We either provide protection for them. My preference would be that we send over uh, some of those big military transports that uh, General Shelton knows uh, very well, that we send them in, that we load them up, and that we bring those people to freedom here in the United States. I would welcome 2,600 new Iranian Americans. But if we're not going to do that, if we're not even going to allow them to use the T walls that they have that are being lined up there, that were supposed to be, you know, provide them protection from from further attacks from from the uh, Iraqi government or from the Iranians, if we're not even going to allow them that defense mechanism, at least allow them to defend themselves. I want to thank all of you for being here today. I want to thank all of our speakers. This was a fabulous group of speakers. I mean, who could not be inspired by the people we heard from today? I want to thank Abi Ameri. I want to thank the uh, Iranian American community of Arizona for sponsoring this. And I want to thank all of you for coming. Thank you again. <laughs>